All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to you this month's Tala Hour. Uh, menu is the key to cost control. We are so excited to have um, Carrie Serrano with Gordon Food Service, one of our industry partners here with us today um, to walk us through all types of things with regards to menu. I'm hoping to learn some stuff, Carrie. Um, and we want to welcome all of our participants that are joining us. Um, Anytime you we have a Tala hour, you can actually use this one hour as a continuing education credit. All you have to do is uh, put who the speaker was, who presented it, uh, the duration, and the content. And you write all that down and you put that in your personnel file, uh, and it gets you one hour of continuing education uh, credit for free. So uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to Carrie. Let her introduce herself. Um, of course, this is being recorded. We'll send it out this afternoon. And also, if you have any questions as we go along, uh, please put those in the chat and we'll try to take those as we go. And if not, we'll catch those at the end. Carrie, take it away. All right, thank you so much. Let me just make sure that I'm sharing my screen. Looks good. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, Tala, and happy Friday. Uh, first off, thanks so much for the opportunity to spend uh, the next Tala hour with you. Um, as we talked about already, cost control is always on our minds. We're always hoping to learn new ways to um, make it easier or make it better. But uh, now's the, the best time to hear a refresher. It's 2024. Um, we're starting a new year. And so my name is Carrie. I am a registered dietitian. I am a business solutions specialist for Gordon Food Service. And so for those of you who have maybe not heard our name before, we are a family owned broadline food distribution company. We have been in the industry for over 125 years. And here in Texas, we have two distribution centers, one in Houston and one in Dallas, and they cover the entire state of Texas, as well as our surrounding states. So today we're gonna start off um, by reviewing the state of the senior living industry. And then we're gonna dive into the cycle of cost management strategies. And as the title says, it begins with our menu and aligning your menu to your goals. So whether you're tuning in today to review a new menu or you're gonna assess your current one, we are gonna take a look at the whole picture um, from menu planning to procurement to operations. And my goal is to leave you with a step-by-step -step guide that can help you to control those costs and lead to guest satisfaction in your community. This is a very recent survey. It was actually just conducted last fall, um, so October of 2023. And as we all know, in today's senior living landscape, dining has evolved significantly uh, to reflect some broader shifts in concepts like health awareness, uh, culinary diversity, technology integration, and so in turn, operators are having to search for new ways to approach dining in their communities to stay competitive and safe uh, as the demand for senior living increases this year and beyond. And so what we can see from this survey, which asks participants, what are the top three challenges related to dining services in today's senior living environment? And we see still number one up at the top is controlling costs and inflation, followed closely behind retaining their labor. And number three relates to that changing landscape, which presents its own challenges in meeting the, uh, the increasing resident demands. This is another recent survey. Um, each year, the Association for Healthcare Food Service, AHF, releases a survey called What Keeps You Up at Night? And it asks, what's the top of mind, what's top of mind for the self-op healthcare food service in senior dining 
industry operators. And so when asked that open-ended question, we see the same exact results here. Number one is labor related to retention. Uh, we see costs um, combating the, the inflation. Uh, we see supply chain. And then additionally, we see the desire for operational efficiency to help with those labor shortages and rising costs. And so operational efficiency is exactly the type of solutions and support that will help you to drive success. And so one of our uh, focus points in today's discussion is going to be highlighting those often overlooked ideas or areas and what to think about them. So what we hear and see is that staffing and cost and inflation continue to re remain uh, top of mind and that communities are under pressure to find savings that won't impact the quality of care or the food service dining experience because our residents' demands are increasing. So this is very challenging. Uh, it, it just, even saying it out loud, it's very challenging. So we're gonna jump in and let's think about how operational excellence focused on your menu can have an overarching impact on cost management. Because what we see in kitchens is that our menu dictates one, how much it costs um, to serve that food, the labor hours necessary, the skill set of your kitchen staff, as well as what supplies and equipment we need to make it all happen. And so on this slide here, we have a menu planning cycle, and we've broken it down into four most impactful steps of the process. And then below each of those steps are bullet points that we think are the most impactful components within each one. Starting with number one is aligning your menu to your goals. So whether you are planning a new one or examining your current menu, it's important to think about what are my goals and have they changed? Um, although it's chilly outside today in Texas um, and we're in the winter months, at Gordon Food Service, we're getting ready to actually release our spring summer menu templates. So we're already starting to have those conversations with our operators about what did you do um, during your last cycle menu that maybe you want to do differently or what things do we want to keep the same? And so having that conversation is kind of that multiple um, disciplinary approach with not only your staff, um, but your leadership as well. So thinking about what does that conversation look like? What should be considered when you're aligning your goals and writing your menu? Um, first is menu philosophy. And this is essentially that level of service that your organization is hoping to achieve through your menu. Um, what does leadership expect? Is dining your brand or your image leader um, out on social media? Are you striving to have more of an upscale restaurant style menu and dining experience for your guests? Does your menu need to meet regulations? How important is your budget? What is your budget? Do you even know what your budget is? Have you had a conversation about your budget um, in the recent months to even years. Where do you stand with labor? So in those two surveys, we saw that this is the number one thing that is keeping up operators up at night. So most likely this is going to have an impact on how you plan out your menu. Do you have enough staff? What's their skill level? What's your turnover rate? Uh, next would be equipment. So do you have the right equipment in your kitchen? Do you have an older kitchen that may um, present some equipment limitations that can impact what you can serve? How important um, are your resident and customer preferences? How often are you asking for feedback? And then are you putting that into action to make those changes? And then last, but certainly not least, is looking at availability. 
Um, we know on the distribution side that it's on operators' minds since the pandemic and even before. Uh, but this needs to be a key consideration when planning your menu to see whether uh, products, if it's a supply chain issue or is it simply a uh, seasonal product that you can't get all the time. So if we take those seven key considerations, when we take a look at this visual, um, this is kind of showing that level of importance on how an operator might rank those components of a menu. And so we see that this organization is very ideal. They've got a strong menu philosophy. It aligns with uh, regulations. It matches their budget. Then behind that, um, we're taking into account resident and patient uh, preferences and equipment on hand. And then kind of in the back there is our labor and availability kind of fall in a lesser importance with planning the menu. But then what if this same operator the next day after figuring out this whole conversation about aligning their goals, what if the next day they walk in and staff members have quit, kitchen equipment is breaking, so now your labor is extremely limited. Once you can find new labor, you've got to train them. And then you're trying your very best to stay in line with that menu that you and your leadership talked about, as well as keeping up with your resident preferences. But right now, labor issues combined with breaking equipment is making it very difficult to execute that planned menu because your leadership wanted scratch cooking, but now you don't have the labor to do so. So instead you're gonna to have to switch your focus and you're gonna to have to put labor in that bright green big circle um, and buy more convenience foods. And so in return, that's going to cost more. It might not meet that resident preference and it may not stay compliant. So this operator is going to have to not necessarily rewrite the whole menu, but really take a closer look at it to readjust based on um, their current situation and revisit those goals. And I think this is a really good example. I think we've all heard this in real life. Um, it's not just a made up scenario. But in fact, um, menus are looking much differently than they did before for a multitude of reasons. Um, we have seen operators change their approach and get really creative with dining since coming out of the pandemic where cost and labor shortage, resident demands are constantly changing. But what happens is when you're not, when you're not going along with those changes, you're using a menu that's not aligned with the current state of your operation or say those post-pandemic service level goals. And so these bullet points, I think, really sum it up nicely. You've got frustrated staff. You see a decrease in your resident satisfaction. You see more food going into the trash, not staying compliant, and you're way out of budget. So this, this right here kind of sums up to me that this is such a critical first step in the menu planning process, and it needs to have uh, enough time and attention given to it so that you can move on and be successful in the next steps of this process. So once we've worked through validating our menu philosophy, aligning with regulations and preferences, and compared that to our current budget and our labor, that's when we can move on to this second wave of the cycle, which is called product optimization. And really, this is a fancy phrase for making the most out of the products that you're spending your money on. And so two key areas in this category is one, streamlining those ingredients on your menu and two, maximizing your purchasing contracts. I don't have it here on the screen, but I did also think about um, talking to your um, food distributor rep about commodity items is another thing when you're optimizing your products is finding out those um, items where the price fluctuates with market trends. So thinking about um, poultry or eggs. And if you're having that conversation and um, right now the market is uh, pr pricing those items pretty high, 
that might be an opportunity to replace those with a different item on your menu to minimize those costs. Okay, so first is let's review our shopping list. The best way I've found to do this um, is um, filtering your shopping list either by storage category or alphabetically because we wanna look at all the like items in one place. So if you see you're buying different types of condiments, maybe two or three different types of ketchups, uh, you got multiple different sliced cheeses on there. Um, could we take those off and have just one or two items? Um, one thing I usually see that falls under this category is bacon. I've seen like eight to 14 different types of bacon cuts on somebody's shopping list. And so asking yourself, do I really use those all or can I get it down to just two or three? And then secondly is standardizing products to enable that cross utilization, which means using a single item across two or three like applications. So an example of this could be using the same chicken breast for all of your uh, chicken entrees um, and then using that same chicken breast to slice and top a salad from say your always available menu. Um, you can also think about using, um, increasing the application of a single item. So you're only purchasing that one item, but uh, for example, you could have mac and cheese on your menu as a side one day, and then the next day it could be featured as a chef special um, using that same mac and cheese, but then top it with barbecue pork or uh, taco meat and make it a taco mac and cheese. And that's gonna really um, expand your typical daily offerings while still using that one ingredient. And so just as you want to slim down the variety of the products that you purchase, you also want to uh, limit the number of vendors that you're using. And we'll talk about uh, why this is important uh, in the next couple of slides. So considering the timing on your menu offerings to maximize the use of your leftovers is also important when you're streamlining your order guide. This example here talks about if you're using a cycle menu and you have beef pot roast on week one, and then you have a beef vegetable soup in three weeks, could you move those two uh, closer together? So that way you're using up any leftovers of that beef pot roast in the beef vegetable soup before they go bad and you're having to uh, throw that product away. And then along the same lines of product usage, you want to avoid over-purchasing. So oftentimes we'll see that price tag of the, let's say a larger uh, pack of um, potatoes and the staff member is like, okay, I'm gonna get those. Um, and they're proud that they spent less dollars. Um, but then a week later, you find that you're having to um, pay extra staff to wash out a bin of all the spoiled potatoes and now you're throwing them all away. So pretty much you're just throwing um, the, that um, extra product in the trash and, and it's costing you money. And so in that example, depending on your labor and the quantity that's needed, you might wanna consider a value added product. And so those are things that are gonna be smaller and maybe they're uh, prepared. So they're going to cost a few dollars extra um, but they could save you time and money in the long run. And then I also added this example of a retail price tag um, on this slide. When I used to give grocery store tours um, to patients and educate them about reading food labels and when they're out shopping, it's important to take that extra second to look at the smaller unit price. Because again, this is an example of a yogurt, um, but that 32 ounce container of yogurt is significantly cheaper than the smaller one. But in your household, if you purchase that, do you, are you going to, to eat all that before it expires? Um, so really just taking the time when you're placing your order and you're setting up your order guide to, to inspect those different product qualities. 
And then the second point, key point under product optimization is maximizing your purchasing contract or your GPO, group purchasing organization. So really cashing in on that. Um, but it's important to understand how those work. I get a lot of questions about what does this mean for me? And so you want to understand the rebates and incentives that your contract um, offers and how that might affect the cost of your menu. And so here are some typical areas to be aware of would be that product value analysis. So just like we talked about streamlining your order guide and looking for those duplicates, you also want to take that list um, and look at your high spin categories. So that could be things like your center of the plate items, um, your chemicals, and look for three different things. Look for anything that's not on your purchasing contract. And if it's off contract, is there an on contract product that you could replace it with? And then secondly, alternate brands. So is there an equal but more affordable brand um, of that same item? And then matching that with your brand rebates could really start to maximize your contract. And then streamlining those similar items, we talked about that is um, condense where you can. If you've got eight to 14 types of bacon on there, can you take that down to two or three on contract um, bacons? And then understanding how the number of deliveries, your drop size, your minimum order, payment terms, all those things can positively impact savings. And so that's why I mentioned earlier that limiting your number of suppliers can really um, help you because if you can order a bulk of your needs from say just one vendor that um, you have a, a group purchasing contract with, you may qualify for a higher rebate check um, because you're meeting that higher delivery size incentive. Okay, so at this point, we have our menu planned. Our menu is aligned to our goals. Our order guide is perfect. So we've gone through our product optimization activity. And now we're halfway through the cycle, so we can start thinking about how to operationalize it. And so the two areas that are key for cost control in this part of the cycle is managing your inventory and forecasting your production. This is an example of an operation. This is a real picture. Um, and so what do we see in this picture? is I see a lot of boxes, a lot of cans, a lot of products, almost touching the ceiling, all over the floor, stacked everywhere. Um, and so when we think about all this product as dollar bills, we can think that that's a lot of money that's tied up in inventory. And do we think that the staff um, at this community is going to be able to use all this product um, before it expires? And also how do they know how to rotate it? Um, it's just such a full storage room that it makes it very hard to practice that operational excellence and managing the inventory. But then on the flip side of the coin, this is another real life photo of way different, uh, too little inventory. And there's also consequences to having too little inventory. Um, so in this example of this picture, this was a community that had two days of inventory on hand and their next delivery was not coming for another five days. So not only does this result in a large citation, uh, but it also increases st stress um, on the staff members. We're not maximizing that group purchasing contract because now we're having to run out to the local grocery store and buy anything that we can find there. And back two steps, this is not aligning with the goals um, that we had originally set. So our cost control is way out the window when we see this too little of inventory on hand. And so when we think about operational excellence, 
managing inventory starts with best practices like creating those order lists, establishing par levels to balance uh, over and under purchasing. So like we saw in the pictures, overstocking too much inventory on hand is going to result in waste. So things are going to get expired, damaged product that will go in the trash and it will also negatively affect our cash flow. But then understocking uh, will certainly cause that employee stress, which could result in uh, turnover. You know, that would be extreme. But and then undoubtedly, it will result in disappointed guests in the dining room. Um, next is rotating product using that first in, first out method, and then performing regular inventory checks. So if you have a regular cleaning schedule for your staff to follow, um, say on a daily or a weekly basis, add cleaning your storage rooms as part of that so you can stay on top of those checks. And then secondly, limit the unnecessary expenses by forecasting production. If we are overproducing meals, this can result in one, a misuse of our labor and two, food waste. So it's important to use standardized recipes, but that are scaled to yield the right amount of product. I'm sorry, the right amount of portions that you need for your service. I've been into several communities um, more recently that I'll ask to see their scaled recipe and it'll say, let's just say an example of a hundred portions. And when I ask somebody in the kitchen, how many residents they currently have, or what's their current census, they might tell me something like 70. So the census has gone down, but we're still using a recipe that's producing more than um, 30 more portions that ultimately could be being discarded. And then a portion control. So do your staff members understand what appropriate portion sizes look like? Do they know what six ounces of meat looks like? Um, are they leveling off the serving spoon when plating a meal? Um, and if not, if you're observing that we're over portioning or under portioning, then we need to make sure that we are providing adequate training as well as um, accessible kitchen tools can also make it, it a lot easier on them to, to monitor that portion control. This is another survey question from the senior housing news survey I mentioned earlier from last fall. And this asks, uh, which of the following cost control measures is your organization utilizing? And what we can see here is that technology support was the number one response through menu planning technology. So using a menu software is a really easy tool to help control your costs and your labor cost, your food and labor costs. You can also get things like your nutrition analysis, standardizing the quality and streamlining production, all the good things for your food service operation. Um, but saving time and improving accuracy with technology tools can be really valuable in things like your recipe and your menu production, but also in inventory, procurement, uh, forecasting. And so at, at Gordon Food Service, we offer a lot of different solutions that tap into this accuracy, but it integrates into one system. So it's it's really nice that you're not having, I, I feel like when I hear people talk about technology, they're a little bit hesitant or nervous um, because it's a new tool to learn and how do we know if it's correct? So it's just taking that time to really understand it um, and just knowing that it's 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 all in one, hopefully. Um, we've got some that integrate with our ordering system as well as some that may even um, integrate with your electronic health record system as well. So explore what's out there and available to you. Um, some technology tools are free, others, um, may be a service fee, but ultimately that could be helping your operation save money. A lot of um, technology companies now offer free demos or um, free training. So just see what's out there. 
because adopting technology can impact your operational excellence in a variety of ways. Um, but what we mostly care about is then it takes that pressure and that added stress off of your staff so that they can focus more on your residents' um, well-being and their satisfaction. So we made it to the final piece of the cycle, and this is measuring outcomes. And as we've covered, there are a number of operational concerns that come up in senior dining every day. So it's really important that we are tracking that uh, via reporting, um, auditing, et cetera, so that we can measure those outcomes and review them for process improvements. If you think about it, uh, you can't make smart decisions about costs um, at home, at work, unless you're tracking them and you're monitoring them. Um, so we're gonna quickly cover uh, three different ideas that you can use to monitor. And the first one is benchmarking. What is benchmarking? Um, benchmarking is a tool that allows you to compare yourself to like other uh, competition. And you can use that to stack up and use data to find improvements. Uh, so is it some different opportunities for you to improve against your competition? It helps you to set some new goals. So looking what others are doing or achieving. But I really like the last bullet point there of justifying costs to administration, because as we talked about getting that mindset shifted from pre-pandemic to post-pandemic is maybe your budget, your ideal budget is way under what uh, your competition is showing. And so that gives you an opportunity to take some data to your administration, to your leadership, and present a case of why you need a higher budget to stay competitive within your, um, within your specific area of the industry. So I really like that bullet point there. Um, but some key performance indicators that often you'll see with benchmarking programs are divided into menu costs and operational costs. So your menu to be broken down into your raw foods, your non-food, so this would be anything like your beverages, your plateware, um, and then supplements. And all that gets summed up into a total cost per resident uh, per day amount. And then your operational cost, this is your labor hours per resident per day, and then the cost net of cash per resident per day. There is limited data out there in the industry of specific to assisted independent living and retirement communities. We have some collected from a long-term care spend analysis that we'll uh, collect and use from, from customers that share information. Um, but this slide here, this is actually from the ANFP Association of Nutrition and Food Service Professionals on skilled nursing. But what you can see here is based off the 50th percentile of all regions, it's broken down into those different categories. And that way, a skilled nursing facility in that same area could look at these numbers and see where they're falling in line with the competition. When you benchmark against your own self, um, you can track your own progress as well. So this is an example um, that we've seen and it helps to really uncover some problems. So in this example, you can see that from like May to July, um, this customer saw that their costs were going up and this uh, leadership thought, okay, let me, let's go investigate what's going on here. And so what they figured out is that there was new staff, a new manager, who was placing the food orders and they were not following the shopping list or the order guide, which led to buying whatever they saw, um, buying things that were not optimizing that purchasing contract. And so with a little bit of guidance and training, we can see from July to September that that number came back down. But then we see from September to November that the cost started going up again. So again, it's questioning, okay, what's going on um, and what was figured out, for example, was that staff was not using 
um, the correct portion sizes when serving the resident meals. And so that resulted in buying more product because they were going through it a lot faster than what their menu had originally predicted. And so again, with some training there, you can see from November to December that that number came back down um, in line. So it's a really good way for you to not only compare yourself to others, but also track your own um, pro progress month to month. And then this is another example that I really liked. You can see, you know, the budget is staying fairly consistent. Um, the first part of the year jumps up and then it significantly jumps down. And that's a good thing. You kind of like your mind goes into, okay, cool. What's happening here? And so in this example, um, this community actually was piloting a uh, bird, I'm sorry, food first program. And so instead of spending their money on supplements, as you can see, they decided to um, make their own in-house. And so that dropped their um, average from, it looks like $1 down to 25 cents to 50 cents. And so making that change, they saw some great cost savings. This is an example of a resource that's available uh, to you. This is the Association for Healthcare Food Service Benchmarking Express. Um, you can go on their website and see um, if this would be something that you might find valuable for you to start using as a benchmarking program. I just put that in there as a resource. So behind uh, benchmarking your costs, you also wanna listen to what your residents are saying and track their satisfaction. Uh, this could be something as formal as, um, you know, your, your dining staff attending a resident council meeting and talking about the current menu offerings. You could survey new residents as they're coming into your building, or it could be as informal as, you know, setting, a, setting aside some time um, throughout the week to walk around your kitchen, I'm sorry, your dining area during a meal service to listen to the conversations that they're having. Maybe it's about the food. Um, you can observe their body language and if they're truly enjoying the meal or if it looks like they're dissatisfied. And then also watching uh, the plates as they come back to the kitchen and seeing, you know, is there 100% still left on the plate or is it zero? And in senior living, um, we really want to lead with that person-centered approach. So this allows your residents to be heard, um, especially when they've got some complaints and they see those changes, they get really excited because now they get to eat what they want. And the third piece for measuring outcomes is through food service audits. And so some of the benefits um, from doing these um, audits regularly is that you're seeing um, the results through a new lens. And so a new set of eyes versus what we're seeing day to day, we might not pick out as, huh, this could be um, a problem and it, it gets swept under. So seeing it from a new lens, you can identify those problem areas and gather data. Um, and then it allows you to drive performance and replicate those best practices. If you have multiple locations and you do an audit at maybe um, one of your locations that's receiving some more negative feedback, you can replicate that and make sure that that's happening across all of your communities. And then it assists your department with cost control and survey readiness. So all great benefits that come out of doing these audits. And then that, then you can take that data and you can assign the action steps, the goals, the responsibility, and a target date for improvement. So these really tell you where to focus and where to start. And so these next couple of slides show some so, uh, show several different areas where you can do an audit when it relates to cost control. This first one, and they don't have to all be extremely formal. Um, I kind of use the term audit in quotation marks. Um, but for procurement, you know, this is having that open conversation with your distribution partners. Um, where can you help me find some better priced um, items? How can you help me look at my GPO contract and find more items that are going to give me that rebate incentive? And then you can take that information back to change up your order guide, 
look at your inventory, check those par levels. Next one is menu and food production. Um, this is always very insightful when you can watch a meal service and really observe the flow of the production and the serving of the meal. It's a really great opportunity to watch for things like efficiency and performance because it may not equal dollars, let's say, on your in, at the end of your invoice, but this could help to really save time and motion in the kitchen, which ultimately does help with, um, with cost control. So things like evaluating your menu cycle, food costs, standardizing those recipes, and where can you make those changes in forecasting and production planning. Waste. Waste is always a hot topic. Um, I've actually felt like I've seen more and more operations and companies who are posting publicly on social media about their goals and their initiatives to reduce their food waste by X percent in the year or the ways that they're um, increasing sustainability in their operations. And so when you're auditing something like this, you can look to see, okay, are my deliveries coming in? Am I getting the product that I really ordered or was it a mispick or is it damaged um, and, and getting a credit for that or organizing your storage areas, rotating them, making sure that you're looking um, that you're secure, that you have security in the back of the kitchen. So you're not dealing with any kind of theft or um, product that's, that's missing meal tracking. And then um, another big one is that preventative maintenance schedule. So staying ahead of any potential issues and having your, um, your maintenance team come in regularly to check your equipment. And then a financial audit. So this is um, making sure that you are up to date with your credit terms. Um, you know, you don't want to fall behind on paying those invoices. And then it comes to the point where you have a much larger payment that you have to um, fork over. Um, if you have a retail environment, so if you have a coffee shop um, or some kind of um, retail space where you can charge guests is making sure that you're staying competitive and you're not actually losing money when you're selling items there. If that's your goal, um, that make sure you're, you're in line with your food cost and your retail pricing there. And then meeting with your vendors for those business planning sessions and having that open conversation about finance and where you are and where you want to see yourself. And so that brings us back to this familiar picture of um, if you want to look at it as the end uh, or the beginning of this continuous cycle, depending how you want to look at it, it can start over and over again um, for you. So just remembering that it takes time. Um, and we've talked about a lot of stuff today that requires not just yourself, but your whole team and their commitment. So it's not meant to get overwhelmed with, but more used as a continuous process and see, you know, where you're at. Are you at number one, two, three, or four? And then you start there with your team and you let that process work its way through. And so my key takeaway message here um, is hopefully to, you know, allow cost control to be that daily mindset for you and your department. If you find that you're falling behind, you're always having to recover, it's stressful and it's really hard to dig out of that hole or habit. Um, so using this step-by-step -step guide that we walked through today can really help you and your staff to build a culture that's focused on fiscal stewardship. Um, and that will be your ultimate key to operational success. Um, at the end of the day, all of us, um, whether we're like myself in the distribution side, if you're a dietary manager, if you're uh, in leadership, our customers are our residents and we want to make them feel satisfied in their with their dining experience um, in our communities. So reach out to your support teams for help and get started sooner rather than later. And so that ends the presentation. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. And I will turn it back over to Diana. Thank you, Harry. Harry, I have a question. 
Um, in that uh, product optimization section, um, you had a uh, talking about value added products. Uh -huh. um, can you tell us what exactly uh, some examples of that would be? Yeah, yeah. So value added products um, might be something that you just take out of a bag and it's ready to serve. So thinking about um, instead of a, a, a garlic head, a ready set serve garlic would already be peeled cloves. Um, you can even go an extra step and they might be peeled and minced and you just pull them out of a jar. Um, some other examples might be um, lettuce. Instead of buying the whole head of lettuce, you're buying lettuce that's already been um, washed and, and trimmed and cut. And so you're taking that out of the bag for a salad instead. Gotcha. You wanna uh, put your video on so we can- Yeah, I'm sorry. No problem. My, you know my three screens. <laughs> didn't want to be there looking away the whole time okay okay yeah so so oftentimes we do hear pushback about those um ready set serve items is that they are a higher invoice cost um but they can help you with labor and time so uh i get it now because i'm a big value added <laughs> A product person then because I like buying the onions that are already chopped really small for me and then. Right. No, and, and I'm the same way in the grocery store. You often see, oh, that would be so helpful for tonight's dinner, but it is more expensive. Yes. Um, it just depends on how much time you have. <laughs> That's <And> true. <laughs> does anyone, oh, we do. We have some questions. I was just about getting ready to ask. I'm going to put that talus thing up too real quick. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, I will be sending out the uh, presentation and the video recording uh, as soon as I get it back from the cloud. So anyone that registered, I know we always have people that register and then something comes up and they can't attend. So if you have a friend that registered, but they weren't able to come, uh, and then, of course, you at, who's attending as a registrant, you will be getting that uh, later on this afternoon. Uh, and please feel free to share. We'll just uh, ask to make sure people know that this, you got this information from the Tala Hour. Um, and we had our guests, Gordon Food Service and Terry Serrano, with us today. Any other questions? Ah, here we go. How many days of inventory would you say is the correct amount? That's a tricky well, question. Yeah. So um, those pictures are are quite um, enlightening. Obviously, if you're getting a truck delivery, let's say twice a week, I always recommend don't order off the back of the truck. So don't wait until that next delivery that you're physically waiting for that truck to arrive because you need those items to produce your breakfast or your lunch that day, um, especially here in Texas, we never know what the weather is going to be this time of year. So, um, you know, that brings up, have your emergency supplies on hand because in the instance, your truck doesn't get there on its, um, on its correct delivery time, you do have something you can fall back on. But I would say, um, a good rule of thumb would be if you get a delivery, let's say, Tuesday and Friday, you'd want to have enough to at least get you from Tuesday through the weekend. So getting you to almost to that next uh, truck. Um, I think also, the big message there is having your emergency supplies on hand just in case. It, exactly, here. I was going to say there are also emergency preparedness requirements that all communities have. Um, that requires that you have enough on hand if, heaven forbid, we get another Yuri, we get another ice storm, uh, you need to make sure you've got enough on hand that you'll be able to take care of your folks. Um, we have another question here. Menu planning software, can you give us some commonly used uh, examples of that software? Yeah, yeah, there are a lot <laughs> um, out there. So, um, First, I would recommend working with your food distributor. Most now we have a menu software that we have linked to um, 
an ordering platform. So I would reach out to your current vendors and see what they already have. Um, some other common ones um, also can integrate with um, Point Click Care if you use that in your community. So you can check out their website to see what um, menu softwares do um, integrate with those two systems. Um, but there's there's a lot out there. Um, I can't really endorse one specific one, but if you go into Google and you type in um, menu planning technology or menu planning software, um, you can usually find some templates that might even be free or very little cost. And then there's different packages that allow you to see, you know, templates, access to recipes, access to um, cost analysis tools. Um, so you can usually find one that's going to fit what needs you have and what um, your budget allows for. Um, what I often see is if you do have a, um, uh, if you are a community that has multiple locations, and if your, um, if your menu is determined at the corporate level, a good way to save some extra dollars on that is let the, the corporate dietitian or your corporate team who manages the menu, let them buy that license or that technology piece, and then they can distribute it out um, to the different communities, or they can uh, get us a lower cost license fee so that those operators at the individual community might just need to grab a recipe or grab a, a, a report, but they don't need to have that full package um, and that price tag. Yeah, you also might, um, if you're a smaller community and you're on your own, you also might look for trials. Um, some place, some some different software companies will have trials, or if you approach them, if they don't have them listed on their website, sometimes you can convince them to let you have a trial so you can try it out to see if it's going to work for you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we've got... You mentioned using market data to make the argument of raising our uh, PRD to be more competitive. Can you recommend how we can obtain this data for our analysis? Yeah, so like I mentioned, um, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot specific for AL and IL out there. Um, the, the information that I shared could still be somewhat applicable, um, but looking at the ANFP website, um, as well as you can um, get with your consulting dietitian group, you can get with your food distributor and see where are your costs coming in each month. And then um, you can pinpoint that to the data that you find um, in local uh, regions, so white communities like yourself. And so where I really like that bullet point is if you find that you're being told that your budget is, let's just say five, five dollars, and you're seeing that um, you're always going over and that the benchmarking data that you found from this association that relates to like communities in your area, and it's seven dollars, let's say that kind of gives you some statistical data and research to go and say, um, you know, I really need to up my budget. Food costs are going up, labor, inflation. You could pretty much take this whole presentation probably and say that these are what we're, we're facing. And then this is where we're falling in line. Um, so can we look at revisiting our budget? Mm -hmm. Some great questions. Any other questions? Well, Carrie, thank you so much with, be, with being with us today. I want to thank all of our attendees. Um, we've got some stuff coming up, y'all. Please, um, if you need your AL managers, uh, any if you've got any new managers that need their training, we're going to have an in-person class in the DFW area. February 21st through the 23rd. We, of course, always have our virtual options. Um, we also have a lot of people that wind up taking the regulations portion every year. Uh, they use it as part of their continuing education hours, and they just want to brush up on the regs uh, every year. So uh, if you use it that way, you might want to consider doing it in person. 
Uh, we've got a fabulous instructor. Uh, he's a lot of fun. Uh, he does games. He gives away stuff. People are really enjoying it. We also have a new leadership development series uh, available on the website, so please check that out. And then I also want to remind everyone that our annual conference is going to be in uh, April, April 2nd through the 4th in San Antonio, Texas at the Hyatt Hill Country. A beautiful resort. We're looking forward to having a lot of fun there. We've got a lot of new stuff that we're going to do. So uh, we're hoping to make it really exciting. Uh, we just set the schedule yesterday. Incredible educational content, y'all. It was We had more submissions than we've ever had. It was really, really hard uh, narrowing down to pick our speakers. We actually are going to have three leadership tracks on the last day. We usually just have two. We just there were so uh, many incredible submissions. So we hope you can join us uh, in San Antonio in April. Uh, and with that, thank you. We'll give you the rest of your day. And I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Barry, thank, thank you so much. Have a great Take weekend. Bye-bye.